Hi everyone, the Spare Room Project rumbles on and in today's video I'm going to show you how I've made these shake style Victorian style panel doors. Now there are lots of ways to make panel doors like these and you'll see lots of carpenters on YouTube telling you you've got to make them with loose tenons or you know proper mortise and tenon construction but the problem with sort of loose tenon doors those sort of doors is you need all the tools you need a router table and all the router bits that go with that but you know how I roll on this channel in today's video I'm going to show you DIYers like me how you can make lovely looking doors like this with a pretty basic set of tools yes they are mock panel so there's no paneling on the back but when they look this good why does it matter So how do I make my mock panel doors? Well, it's very simple. The main part of the door or the base sheet is 12 millimeter MDF. The panels themselves, also known as rails and styles, are made up of another piece of 12 millimeter MDF. And then finessing the panels to make them look more traditional. In the past, I've used molding like this, but for today's doors, I'm going with this slightly more refined molding. So here we are, these are the four sheets of 12mm MDF that I actually I had, had these cut down at the um, timber merchants a long time ago. I'm just really hoping they've been stuck in my garage here. I've kept them as flat as I can. The thing about MDF is if you do not keep it completely flat, if you don't store it properly, it will warp. So I'm just praying that these sheets of MDF are going to be okay. They look all right at the moment, but let's just keep our fingers crossed. So in terms of the actual carcass of the cupboard itself I may do a video on this I don't know whether any of you will be interested but basically it was when we stripped out the wallpaper revealing this horrible lead paint underneath wasn't sure really what to do with it so in the end I decided to clad the whole thing in MDF I could have plastered it but it was too late for that so I've gone 18 mil 18 mil 18 mil MDF with 6 mil MDF at the back of the cupboard the point of the 18 mil MDF is that will support my nickel shelf supports which I've bought. The shelving and everything else that I'm building up inside the cupboard will be in a later video so keep an eye on this playlist for that. And in case you're wondering the central section here was made from two bits of fibre one pine that I cut down, glued and screwed together and then put a little inset 12 millimeter panel in there to match the existing framework of the wardrobe. So first thing I've got to do is cut my base piece of MDF so that it fits perfectly into this frame. Now that would be straightforward if when this wardrobe had been put together in the 1970s they'd made the framework square, but they didn't. So I've got completely out of square doors. Basically I've got to make my doors to the shape of the openings. And to do that I'm going to use my sliding bevel. So come on Chris. Now my attempts to record the process of cutting this shape didn't work out very well on the video but suffice to say you start with your straight edge, this is my straight edge here and then you take all the measurements off that straight edge as you can see in this visual here using your sliding bevel to slowly work around the rectangle until you've got all the measurements you need. Okay we're all set now, just got to get it all cut on the table downstairs. I'm using my circular saw guide to cut these angles. It is not ideal. Uh, what I really need is uh, two, um, a, a short circular saw guide and then a longer one. And when I get my bench holes, I'll be able to clamp much closer to the edge of the bit of wood I'm working on. But it's kind of doing the job for now. And now I've got the fence on that comes with the circular saw because it's a really easy way to do long runs. It's 
So I'm now holding up my piece of wood, see how the first cut is shaping up. And actually, we're not looking too bad, you know. We're basically completely lined up at the bottom. Happy with that parallel line up there. It looks like a big gap, but don't forget, the door is right, sat right down on the carpet at the moment. We've got a bit of a mismatch there and a bit of a gap there. So at this point I get my electric plane out. It's my go-to tool when I want to take slithers off a long piece of MDF like this or any other piece of timber in a controlled and accurate fashion. And then it's back to the circular saw to take larger pieces off. Yay, that now fits perfectly. So the door now completely matches the very out of square wonky shape of the opening. I've got myself a little gap at the top which when that's halved will be absolutely perfect. I think you'd struggle to make a loose tenon door when you've got a really tricky uh, shape like this. The beauty of this is we've now got the base shape for the door it is tight, but it's got to be tight because when I lay the framework of the door around the edge and glue it down, I will then be trimming the entire thing to get it to exactly the right width, as I'll show you later. So that's the first door done. I've just got to do the uh, right hand one now. Right hand door's proving a little bit more problematic. The shape's a bit trickier. So I'm just doing a little bit of minute adjustment using my electric plane. Right, I'm already start cutting the styles and the rails for my shaker style doors. For the styles, which is obviously the long panel that runs down the length of the door, I'm going to be putting the fence on my circular saw and I'm going to be cutting eight centimeter strips. I'm also making the top rail from 80 millimeter, 12 mil MDF, but the bottom rail and then uh, the sort of, you know, what you call it, intermediate rail that I'm putting in, I'm gonna double. So I'm gonna have those at 160 mil. Never done one of these before, but I saw this style on a job I was working on recently and I think it's really smart. It's coming up on the screen now and I think it's gonna look great. And now is a fun bit of putting the door together. The most important thing to remember when you're assembling a door like this with styles and rails that are sort of mock and they're sort of fitting on top of the back beat. The back bit is you must construct your door on a flat surface. I've done this before in between workbenches and basically when you glue and nail these down you're basically locking in whatever shape maybe they're leaning between two workbenches that shape will be locked into the door. So it's paramount importance you construct your door on a flat surface. I want to get the glue right up to the edge because we want to make sure the styles knit on as well as possible, particularly where we're going to have the hinges. A lot of people have made comments that this way of construction gives you problems when you lay your hinges, but I haven't found this myself.
glue is drying too quickly. Slightly panicking me. Right, get that on there without delay. Make sure it's in the right position. Right, I'm clamping that down now. You want to make sure if anything that there's a slight overlap because we're going to be trimming these doors down to size anyway once all the styles and the rails are on and the glue is dried. Right, I've experimented with lots of different ways of doing this in the past. I've screwed in from the back, I've screwed in from the front which gives you a lot of filling to do and I've found the best thing to do is I've got here a pack of panel pins, these are 20 by 1.6 millimetre and I'm just going to periodically nail these in. Again people make a bit of a meal of this, they say oh you know panel and filling in from the front gives you a lot of filling to do, it really doesn't and the holes are easy to fill, very quick to fill, very quick to sand The smaller the punch you can find, this is actually a really good one, the better because that minimises the amount of filling you're going to have to do. There we go, lovely tidy job. It's time to cut the top rail to size. Cut it with a saw. I'm using here my floorboard saw, but universal saw, anything sort of saw like this would suffice. That's probably going to be a bit too big. I'm hoping so. Oh no. Maybe just needs a little bit of sanding. Going to give this a tiny tickle with my belt sander. Check it fits. Again, a lot of carpenters make a meal of this part of it, saying it's really hard to get these right. It's not. And in any event, you can fill any minute little gaps you've got once the whole thing is constructed. The important thing, remember my doors are a bit off square. The important thing is to get the rails square with the styles because then you can trim the outside. You, what you don't want to do is have it like that um, because it'll make the whole door really weird in the, uh, in, the, in the frame where, like me, you've got slightly wonky wardrobe frames. I'm doing the bottom rail. The bottom rail is 16 centimeters, so it's double the width of the of the styles. mid-rail now. I 
what I'm doing with this, I'm offsetting this so it's not in the centre of the door, it's slightly lower down and I've been trying to work out how, what sort of point to have it at. The actual door as you walk into the room is about the, the um, door knob's about 85 off the ground so I'm making this 80 off the ground because this door's slightly shorter. I haven't glued that in yet but I'm going to take it upstairs and see what it looks like. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. I think that looks quite smart. That was a point I was making about the, the main door as you walk into the room. Now, this is where it gets interesting because this is the point where I'm taking a sort of classic shaker style uh, wardrobe door like this and I'm going to finesse it with some moulding. And in the past, I've used this stuff. I actually bought a load of these from the range would you believe it recently? I think they were about sort of four pounds or three ninety-five a, uh, a strip or something like that. And you'll see on the screen now coming up um, some images of previous covers I've done with this sort of moulding. Now, I bought these recently because I thought I was going to do exactly the same thing again. And you can see the sort of effect this gives. But then, when I was on site for a customer recently and saw some really smart cupboards that have been built, it occurred to me that this is a little bit too much. So out with this, even though I bought four sheets of it, and instead I picked up this from my local DIY store. It's not perfect, I would have preferred it if it had been a proper sort of right angled 90 degree quadrant because it makes it rather tricky for me to glue on. Um, the way it is. But once that is in place that's going to look pretty good. So I'm going to do that now and I'm going to do it without a chop saw just to show you how you can achieve a really lovely finish with very basic tools. There's probably much nicer decorative mouldings out there and actually I would have preferred, if I'm going to be brutally honest, to have done it that way around. But unfortunately it's not designed for that with the depth of these 12mm 12, 12 MDF, it sits perfectly like that. So I need a 45 degree angle here. I always do this like that just so that I know what I've got to cut. And here, because I haven't got my chop saw with me today, I'm going to use this mitre box that I made many years ago. So, the first one I want these to fit really tight because I'm going to be just gluing them in with a impact adhesive. So I don't want I'm not using panel pins for this. And I'm pretty pleased with that. moldings down I usually use something like grip fill but when I was down at my local DIY store I saw this Gorilla heavy duty grab adhesive. The Gorilla brand is so all powerful but I very rarely used any of their products so I thought it'd be really interesting to see what this grab adhesive was like so I thought I'd buy a tube even though it was more than double the price of the grip fill.
So what do I think about the Gorilla Grab Adhesive? Well, I wasn't bowled over by it. To me, it's like a slightly stickier decorator's cork. It's got the same consistency. And even when it was set 24 hours later, it was still quite soft and rubbery. Now, I guess they would say it retains its flexibility, which is good for some joints. But I like grip fill because it goes reassuringly hard and it just seems to have more grab properties to it. But you know, that's just me. Let me know what you think about this stuff, if you have a chance. Right, here we are with the doors. The next step is to fill the little holes left by the panel pins and then trim the edges. Got my new tin of wood filler. I'm mixing this on a piece of MDF. A lot of people are very critical about me using MDF. I should be using a non an impermeable material but do you know what it's absolutely fine hardly anything sinks in and it provides a really good surface to mix the wood filler on but if you've got an old tin lid or a bit of perspex lying about obviously that would be better I'll use my continental filling knife because it's a really good tool you've got lots of touch you hardly want to put any filler on the surface you just literally want to fill the holes that leaves you minimal work to do when you're sanding it down. going to use my trusty block plane just to feel along and take off any raised parts of the moulding. In an ideal world this moulding would be slightly rebated down from the surface of the MDF. I think it would make it look a bit smarter but unfortunately this was the only moulding I could find at the time and so I've just got to improvise. I've had to come inside because it's going to rain. It's not ideal. I'm going to do a bit of sanding now. My old vibrating sander and a sort of 120 grade sandpaper attached to the bottom. Now you may remember when I was putting the rails in earlier on that I had to get them square which took the rails off the edge of the door because obviously the door's not square. I've got to chill, I've got to chill that off. <laughs> I've got to trim that off now, which I would probably normally do with my electric plane. But this time I'm going to use my circular saw. And there we go. Clearly it still needs planing, but now I've taken the, rough, the big bit off, that's going to be much easier to plane. Now, the next bit of the process is arguably the most tricky for us DIYers because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to be planing the edges of the door just to trim them back to get them level, but the top and the bottom of the door will be plain square, but crucially the left and the right hand vertical edges of the door I'm going to be putting a bevel on. I'm going to be putting a bevel on the inside edge so that it clears the frame as it shuts. I'm going to be putting a bevel on the hinge edge so that when the door is totally shut the hinges don't get in the way of the door turning all the way back into the frame. Tricky because it's a bit of a skill to master using one of these but the more you use it the more confident you'll get. A lot of people ask me why I like to plane with the wood turned on its side like this. If you plane with the wood end on uh, sure you've got sort of control and you can see what you're doing but what you can't see is how close you're getting to any line that you've drawn that you're wanting to plane up to. So to my mind this is a much more accurate way of planing timber. Okay I'm going to aim for something like this on the bevel that's what I'm going to aim to take off the door and typically on the hinge side of the door I tend to take off more than I do on the centre.
Okay, that's looking pretty good. I've just got to repeat that all the way around now. Okay guys, this is the big reveal. Will the doors fit? Remember, this is just the initial test because I obviously still need to put the, get the hinges on. Yes! <laughs> so, taking a quick look at the doors, I am really happy with that. And what I normally do is, I'll, the next step is I'll get the hinges on and once the hinges on I'll probably find I need to plane a little bit more off the inside edges. Um, can't really do that until I've got the hinges on. So that's it, the doors are finally in. In the next video in this playlist, or next week depending on when you're looking at it, I'll be running through the flush hinges I've used on these doors and how I fitted them and how I hung the doors and trimmed them down. I'm not going to do that in today's video because at over 26 minutes I think I've gone on for far too long and quite frankly I'll be amazed if any of you are still actually watching this video. If you are, massive thanks. So I really hope you found today's video useful and it's inspired you. If you're thinking of rebuilding a cupboard or a wardrobe at home, to make you think that you can do this as well. If you like this video, please click on the like button below. And if you're new to my channel, I'd love to have you subscribe. You can do that by clicking on the link here.